Welcome to Lesson 6b, Significance of the Vorticity Equation. In this lesson, we'll discuss the meaning and significance of individual terms in the vorticity equation. We'll introduce vortex stretching, vortex tilting, and viscous diffusion of vorticity. We'll also discuss the usefulness of the vorticity equation and simplify it for 2D flow. Here's the vorticity equation that we had derived in a previous lesson for incompressible Newtonian flow with constant fluid properties. I label the terms 1, 2, and 3. Term 1 is the material derivative of vorticity, which means that it's the rate of change of vorticity following a fluid particle. It contains both unsteady and convective, I prefer the term advective, terms. The second term is the rate of change of vorticity due to vortex stretching and vortex tilting. So we'll call it the vortex stretching and tilting term. Finally, term three is the rate of change of vorticity due to viscous diffusion of vorticity. Let's discuss the physical meaning of each term. We are already familiar with term one. If we have a fluid particle that has some vorticity and it moves in the flow to a new location, the vorticity may change, again due to direct unsteadiness or to advection, which simply means moving from one place to another where the flow field is different. That's our definition of the material derivative. Term two is the vortex stretching and tilting term. All of these terms are vectors, with k being the free index and j being the repeated or dummy index. In vector notation, this is omega dot del acting on u. We'll use both tensor and vector notation in these discussions. What do we mean by vortex stretching? Let's illustrate with an example, a diffuser. We're talking about incompressible flow. So this is, of course, a subsonic diffuser. So the flow decelerates as it moves through the diffuser. If we have a portion of a vortex line here with some vorticity omega 1, as the fluid slows down, this segment of the vorticity line stretches and has a new value omega 2. As it stretches, omega increases, so here omega 2 is greater than omega 1. We're talking about magnitudes, of course. Physically, a small fluid particle that's spinning will spin faster after the stretching. An analogy can be made to an ice skater. When her arms are out, she spins slowly. But when she puts her arms above her head, she spins faster. We always learn this as conservation of angular momentum. The same thing happens to a fluid particle when it gets stretched like this. We used to go ice skating in the pond back of the barn, but I never was able to do that spinner spinner stuff. Me neither, dud. The other component of term two is vortex tilting. This occurs in a velocity gradient. For example, in a portion of the flow where there is shear and the velocity is increasing in the vertical direction. Again, if a segment of a line vortex is here, and since it must follow the flow, the top moves faster than the bottom, so it tilts. If we call this direction z, omega z is the component in the z direction. But after it's tilted, omega z is just the one component of the vorticity vector, with omega x being the other component. Notice that as it tilts, it also stretches. So the magnitude of omega increases, but some of its vorticity, which was all in the z direction, is now in the x direction. This vortex tilting mechanism is a mechanism for generating 3D vorticity. In other words, we can start with vorticity in one direction only, but end up with vorticity components in two or more directions. This is a direct result of vortex tilting. Finally, the viscous diffusion term, which I rewrote here, diffuses vorticity or redistributes vorticity due to viscosity. For example, consider a viscously decaying line vortex. We start at time zero with a line vortex, which is a concentrated vorticity of infinite amount at the origin. If we plot u theta, the tangential velocity component, it's infinite at the origin and then decays as one over r. In fact, we know that u theta is gamma over two pi r. But in a real fluid with viscosity, the flow cannot handle this sudden discontinuity of an infinite velocity at the origin. So after a short time, the velocity profile looks something like that. And as time increases, this viscous inner region keeps growing. This represents time increasing. This inner part we call the viscous core. But far enough away, 
this outer flow region still has this component of velocity. In other words, the effect of viscosity has not yet reached this portion of the flow. If we encircle this flow with a large circle, we can calculate the circulation as the integral over that whole closed circle of u dot ds, where ds is a small line element along the path. And we showed previously that this is also equal to the area integral of omega dot da, where a is the area inside this contour. Since the entire circle is in the outer flow and hasn't yet experienced the effect of viscosity, gamma remains constant for a large radius r, which is the radius of our circle. Of course, eventually, as time keeps going on, the viscous core will reach our circle. Let's consider this same problem in terms of vorticity. Now let's plot the magnitude of omega. At t equals zero, omega, as I said, is infinity. It's a spike in vorticity at the origin. At some time later, the profile looks something like this. And as time goes on, this shape flattens and becomes broader. Again, this represents t increasing. Notice that omega equals zero everywhere outside the viscous core region, which is defined by this vorticity shape. Again, if our circle is outside of the viscous core, where we call this contour C, and we know that gamma, which is the area integral of omega dot dA, is constant in time, again, provided that this circle is large enough. Well, since omega is zero everywhere except in this viscous core, at some time, the area within the vortex profile must remain constant in order for gamma to remain constant. Physically, vorticity diffuses radially. So the viscous term represents a redistribution of vorticity as it diffuses outward. We note that terms 1, 2, and 3, all three terms, can be either positive or negative, depending on what's happening in the flow at a given location. I again rewrite the vorticity equation with its terms labeled, and I rewrite it in words. The vorticity of a fluid particle can change due to two mechanisms, namely vorticity is stretched or compressed or tilted, and vorticity is diffused due to viscosity. And all these terms can be positive or negative. Now let's talk about the usefulness of this equation. Recall that we derived it from the Navier-Stokes equation. So this vorticity equation really has no additional information than what is already contained in the Navier-Stokes equation. It's not a fundamental equation of fluid motion. So what is its usefulness? Why do we even care about it? I'll give you some examples of its usefulness. We can use it for locating a vortex in a flow field. This is really an argument for the usefulness of vorticity itself, not really the vorticity equation. Consider a 2D flow in the xy plane, and either computationally or with PIV, you have some flow field, and you could measure the velocity at various locations. It's hard to see a vortex in a vector plot like this. However, if we plot vorticity contours, you may be able to see concentrations of vorticity. And what's even nicer is that these contours are independent of frame of reference. And we're restricting our argument to a frame of reference moving at a constant speed. If your frame of reference is moving at a different speed, the vector contours will change significantly. But these vorticity contours will remain the same whether you're sitting still or moving at some constant speed in any direction. The magnitude of vorticity is independent of frame of reference. Another advantage, it's sometimes useful in CFD to work with vorticity instead of velocity. And you may have noticed both pressure and gravity terms have dropped out of the vorticity equation. For example, we'll solve the vorticity equation for the viscously decaying line vortex later on in the course. Finally, let's make a simplification for two-dimensional flow in the xy plane. The vorticity vector will have a component only in the z direction, or in tensor notation, we'll use omega-3 for flow in the x1, x2 plane. In terms of omega-3, the third component of the vorticity vector is the only non-zero one. So d omega 3 dt equal omega j del u3 del xj plus nu del squared omega 3 del xj del xj. If we expand this term, we have omega 1 del u3 del x1 
plus omega 2 del u3 del x2 plus omega 3 del u3 del x3. But this term is 0 because omega 1 is 0, as we see here. Similarly, since omega 2 is 0, this term is also 0. And for 2D flow, del del x3 of anything is 0. Thus, this entire term goes away. So we state that in 2D flow, the vortex stretching and tilting term is identically 0. Thus, the vorticity equation is greatly simplified without that second term. Finally, let's consider the stream function, again in a 2D flow. We recall from conservation of mass, we defined the stream function for incompressible flow in the x1, x2 plane as u1 equal del psi del x2 and u2 equal del psi del x1 with a negative sign. This is the definition of the stream function. We also know that omega 3 is del u2 del x1 minus del u1 del x2 by its definition where omega is the curl of the velocity vector. Combining these two equations, omega 3 is negative del squared psi del x1 del x1 minus del squared psi del x2 del x2, which we recognize as negative of the Laplacian of psi in two dimensions. The result is that in a 2D incompressible rotational flow, omega 3 is minus del squared psi, whereas in a 2D incompressible irrotational flow, omega 3 is zero, and therefore del squared psi is zero, which is what we use in potential flow. You can think of this equation as kind of an extension of potential flow or rotational flow. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.